What's happening, polite society? I hope you had a good week. Last time I discussed the recent apostasy by Joshua Harris and how we as Christians should properly ponder and reflect upon desertion when it takes place within the church. Today I'm going to continue that discussion and comment on Josh's recent appearance at a plus pride parade. But this time around, I'm going to focus on a key biblical text that condemns homoerotic practice. And I'll also provide a response to pro-same-sex advocates within the church in relation to that passage. All right, let's delve in. In case you didn't already know, Joshua Harris is the best-selling author of the popular religious book titled I Kissed Dating Goodbye. On recent Instagram posts, Josh informed the public that he and his wife were divorcing and also that he is no longer a Christian. Shortly after making these announcements, Mr. Harris was seen marching in Vancouver's Plus Pride Parade. In one photo, he was wearing a shirt that said, Love is Great Britain, and he was also holding a rainbow-colored donut. In addition, he took some pictures with some well-known plus figures, including Matthias Roberts. Many commenters on this channel have suggested that perhaps Joshua will shortly announce that he is in fact gay himself. I'll just repeat what I said last week, and that is that the historical Christian position on same-sex relationships is the one subject that is equivalent to the first century church's uncompromising stance that Jesus alone is Lord. This is why I have studied this particular subject extensively, listened to both sides of the argument, and will continue to provide the clear biblical view on homoerotic practice on this channel. The tide of quote-unquote gay Christianity is growing within the church, and we as Christians need to be able to provide a clear and cogent biblical response on the subject of same-sex relations. In my second Lauren Daigle video, I briefly walked through Romans 1 and provided a short exegesis. In this video, I'm going to do something similar, except this time around, I'm going to approach that same passage from a Christian apologetical standpoint. Whenever you see a same-sex advocate in the church present the argument that Paul was not aware of faithful and monogamous same-sex relationships, you need to immediately recognize that you are dealing with someone who is not accurately representing the Greco-Roman evidence and context. We actually have debates in the ancient Greek world between proponents of man-male love and male-female love. Even in the Jewish context, we have early rabbinical texts in the 2nd to 4th centuries that describe prohibitions in relation to marriages between men and men. There is even one text that forbids two women being married. There is plenty of source material available that clearly demonstrates that abusive and coercive relationships were not the only forms of same-sex unions. Some pro-gay advocates, like Harry Knox, for example, argue that in Romans chapter 1, Paul is only referring to these types of degrading same-sex activities. But clearly, the apostle is indicting all forms of women-female sexual relationships in Romans 1.26, because lesbianism in antiquity was not noted for having those kinds of characteristics, that is, being conducted in an exploitative context with a prostitute, a slave, or an adolescent. So when lesbianism is being indicted here, it includes committed relationships. This is why Bernadette Bruton, who is a self-identifying lesbian herself, but also a New Testament scholar, and who by no means agrees with me, but is herself an advocate of same-sex relationships, nevertheless argues in her 150-page treatment on Romans 126 that you cannot use the argument that Paul is only indicting exploitative relationships. The indictment of lesbianism makes that absolutely clear. But even when we come to the condemnation of man-male intercourse in Romans 127, Paul talks about mutuality. The men mutually desired one another. He doesn't say something was done to one. That word for desire there is not limited to the kind of lust context that same-sex advocates are talking about. The Greek word epithemeo is used for a desire for any form of sexual intercourse expressly forbidden by God. And the language for being inflamed is likewise used. Paul doesn't simply mean they're just over-lusted, which Dr. James Brownson, another same-sex proponent, argues. And he's not talking only about constitutional heterosexuals who are engaging in homoerotic sex, like Matthew Vines contends. By the way, these are the same people who say that Paul didn't know anything about same-sex orientation as we understand it today. Yet, all of a sudden, here he does. One thing you will notice about gay Christian literature is their inconsistency. You will often see one same-sex advocate completely contradict another. And even if Matthew's argument here was true, and Paul is simply talking about people who are naturally heterosexuals that are engaging in same-sex intercourse, as Dr. Bruton has pointed out, Mr. Vine's argument completely throws the bisexual community under the bus. At any rate, Dr. Brownson, Knox, and Matthew are all wrong. That's not what's being exchanged here in the context. What's being exchanged here in the context 
very clearly, because this is the parallel to the discussion about idolatry and sexual immorality with same-sex intercourse being singled out. The context for the argument is not just that all sin, but that all deliberately suppress the truth about God accessible to them. By that, in the context, Paul means a nature argument, that God manifests who he is and what he has created on the basis of the material structures of creation. That's the clear evidence so that even if Gentiles who do not have access to Genesis or Leviticus or otherwise are still without an excuse. And Paul pinpoints a particular form of sexual immorality, namely same-sex relations, because it is the one offense in the ancient world most characterized as being contrary to nature. All right, thanks for watching, guys. If you liked that video, please give it a thumbs up. If you like the content on this channel, you can subscribe by clicking on the icon on the bottom right, and then you can hit the bell for notifications. I upload a new video every Saturday. I will also be doing my very first live stream later on today at 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. So if you do have time, please check it out. If not, you can always check it later as an upload. Have an awesome week. And for my brothers and sisters in the Lord, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all always. I will see you all in the next video. God's blessings on your week.